Hey guys. Now I said that the test is multiple choice. So, um, and there's a few short answers. So you don't really have to go through all these three response questions. You can read the answers in the back of the book if you want to prepare. I'm just gonna kind of talk through some of the issues. So 3.12, Sarah's parents are concerned that she, she seems short for her age. The doctor kept the following record of her height. Okay, so it looks like 86, 90, 91, 85, 90, 95, 95. Right, and this is her age in months. And then these vary from, so I'll just put 85, 90, 95. So you could go into Staplet and put these in and make a scatter plot of the data, or you could use one of the fancy calculators, right? You'd type that data in. So it says, um, make a scatter plot and describe what you see. So that means you need to be able to dust. So this is something we should be prepared for, right? So 85. What did I do here? Sorry about that. So 30, 40, 50, 60. Okay. Um, so that would be about there, right? The first dot. And then 48, 90. 51, 91. Um, 54, 93. Um, 90. 57 and 94, and 60 and 95. Interesting, right? So if we go to Staplet, we'd probably see a line of best fit. And what would we say about this data? Well, um, it looks as though, so it would spit out a, um, a plus bx, and then we copy it down on the problem if they ask for it. So do they ask for it? Yes, on part B, they ask for it. So we can go ahead and do that. This is the height in centimeters. So your predicted height in centimeters would be equal to your A. And so the printout said this. Um, again, I'm just reading from the back of the book, but you could also think about um, typing in a staplet. And then what is X? That's age. So that is part B. So you would need to be prepared for a question like this, of course, right? And would you be prepared to answer Duff's? I definitely hope so, right? we would say there is a strong, positive, linear association between X and Y, what is X and Y, between age and height. All right. And we'd wanna say anything unusual with the coordinate 86, 86, quite a bit lower in age than the other um, data points. So I'm kind of just talking about this, this gap here, right? It's like that it's still in line with the data, so it's not really unusual. It probably made for just as good of an R, if not a stronger R with that, because it falls in line with the data. It doesn't change the slope or the intercept, but there is a bit of a gap there, right? Okay, then it says calculate and interpret the residual for the point when Sarah is 48 months old. Okay, so when Sarah is 48 months old, 
So that means plug in 48. So what is her height in centimeters would be equal to this. And when I crunch all that number, that means I get that as number 90.348. So what was the actual value at 48? If I look here, it was that 90. So um, the residual is the formula wrap. That's your actual minus your predicted. So your actual is 90 and your predicted is 90.348. So this dot is below the line of best fit. So at 48, I actually didn't graph that dot. That dot would be below the line. Um, and so that would be negative 0.348. Now it said calculate it and then also interpret it. Okay, so some of our scripts tell us um, what that means. That means um, her actual height was 0.348 centimeters lower or shorter, right, than the height predicted by the least grade regression line. at x equal 48 months, okay? So at that point, she was actually shorter than we would have predicted based on just the overall data that we were given. Last one, would you be confident using the equation from part B um, to predict uh, her height at 40 years old? Oh boy, 60 months. Uh, so that's five years old. And our answer would be no. So we talked about this the first couple, like going way beyond that would be a little crazy. So this data is just from zero to five years old. And to use this um, least square, to lose this prediction meter, you wouldn't want to go beyond these X values. And this 40 is not the same as 40 years old. So for part D, I'm just going to write that up here. Got a little bit of room. Part D. Uh, no, not confident using the least grade regression line to predict at 40 years old because that's far outside the um, measured X values. of age. What is X? It's age. Cool. Okay. That's going to be probably the question that's the most popular. So again, if you're figuring out like, well, how would I make that? You could go to Staplet. And we've done that multiple times, right, in class. And we go to two variables. And you type in those numbers. Right, so that was our age in months. And then that was our, um, was your height. And we list off those, right? One over 41, 55, you know, the biggest one was 60. You know, you're just gonna put in those values, okay? So reading the next question, it says, identify anything unusual about the scatter plot and estimate its X and Y coordinate. Okay, so this would be more like a multiple choice question because it'd be a lot to write and kids might have um, varying answers, making it kind of too tough for me to grade. But I can uh, approximate X and Y, right? X looks about negative 19.3, I guess, to the left of that. And it looks about, I don't know, uh, and again, everybody would maybe have a slightly different answer, but if this was multiple choice, you should find be able to find the one near there. So I'd say 340. 
identify an unusual point and estimate its x y. So I found that one. It definitely looks unusual. It doesn't look um, in line with the other numbers. It's also creating a pattern in our, our data. So this line right here, without that dot, it would make more sense to make my line of best bet there. Notice, like, I want to make, like, dots above and below the line. Right now, lots of dots are below because they're trying to make up for this huge um, square area, right? So remember, it's called a least squared regression line, meaning each residual creates an area. And they place the line where the area is above the line. If I added up the areas of these squares, it equals to the areas below the squares. So it's definitely throwing off the data. How so? Well, it's making it, and again, I wouldn't make you describe this, but you should pre um, prepare for a multiple choice question. Notice without this dot, the y-intercept would be higher and the slope would be more negative or steeper. So describe the correlation, again, for multiple choice questions, we know that anything unusual would make the correlation lower or weaker. All right, so that's actually not more negative. Since this is a negative slope, R would be negative. So again, this just makes it closer to one, or two to zero, weaker. What would it do to the slope? Well, as I said, um, without it, um, without the point, it would be steeper, so it's pulling it up, so it's increasing the slope. It's pulling up the line to get closer to it. And what would it do to the y-intercept? So again, with my magic pencil, this was probably the line of best fit without it. And so what is it doing with the y-intercept? Um, it pulled down, it decreased the, um, so as this, it's kind of a lever point here. Notice it was probably more like this before. So it decreased the, um, y-intercept. And what would it do for the standard deviation? So again, that's the average amount that any dot would be away. Um, and so um, that's going to make it higher, right? It's going to be higher because that dot is definitely farther away. So this is a residual that has to get averaged in with a lot of other residuals. So it's gonna, the average residual would be much higher with that number. Okay, so you wouldn't have to write that in a, in a free response, but maybe you'd be prepared to answer it. Okay, so question 14. Here's the question, and then on the next page is, is the rest of the question. So I kind of cut and paste it here so you guys could um, see it all in one page, and I gave myself some space to write about it. It says, the long-term record of the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania shows interesting ecological relationships where the wildebeest are more abundant, they, wildebeest are more abundant, they graze the grass more heavily, so there are fewer forests, fewer fires, and more trees grow. Lions feed more successfully when there are more trees, so the lion population increases. Researchers collect the data on one part of this cycle, wildebeest abundance and the percent of the grass area burned. So they've already explained a negative association, meaning as wildebeest increase, then forest fires go down, right? So what can we say about this relationship? We can see that there is no leftover pattern. Oops, I'm writing the wrong graph. No leftover pattern here. So it looks like some dots are above, some dots are below the line. And actually they didn't even give us the line, but if we try to make a line of best fit, like something like this, um, then there's dots above and below the line. And again, they made us a line here. Notice there's a lot of dots above, a lot of dots below, spattered throughout. 
So is a model, a linear model appropriate? Yes. And so you should be prepared for this. Yes, a linear uh, model is appropriate because there's no leftover pattern in the residual plot. Okay, give the equation of the least squared regression line and be sure to define any variables. Should you be able to do that? Yes. All right, we've been working on that. And this is our A, our B, and our X. So we're gonna say, if we're going to pre predict the percent burned, right, that's our Y axis, it's gonna be A plus BX, right? 92.29 minus 0 0.05, 762 times X, which is our will de beast. Notice this is negative, and that makes sense because I have a negative correlation. All right, part C. Interpret the slope. Does this value of the Y have a context? If so, interpret the intercept. Okay. So let's look at what is our intercept. So that's this. So what does that mean? Well, it's in percent burn. So that means if I plug in zero, what is my y-intercept? Well, in algebra one and algebra two, y-intercept is when x is equal to zero. So when there's no wildebeest, It says 92% um, of burned. So yes, it does have context. So we can read in the book, because I'm trying to over-summarize. It says, why intercept does not have meaning in this context as making a prediction for zero wildebeest is a big extrapolation. So you might be thinking, well, how is that possible? Well, notice that they kind of dorked up with the graph here. This is not at zero, so we can't actually see 90. That would be, um, you're jumping from, it looks like the lowest wildebeest value is still about, um, 200. So that would be a big jump. And also, you this forest has wildebeest in it. So you don't really know what the effect would be with absolutely no wildebeest, okay? But this is what it would mean, is if there were no wildebeest, okay? Now let's talk about um, the slope, all right? And then we'll be done for the day. Oh, we got, well, I spoke too soon. There's, there's the little S and R. We got to do that. That's we got to be ready for it. So B, give it and uh, define any variables. Yes, if so, interpret Y and um, interpret the slope. Okay, so we still got to do a second part of part C. What's the slope? So we notice the slope is this number right here. And we have to interpret that in the context, right? So slope is the change in y over one x, right? So what does that mean? Well, that would mean um, that the percent burned decreases, because this is a negative, by 0 0.057, I'll round that to eight, for every additional, Wildebeest, that's my X. Um, added to the forest. Now I do have to refine something here. It says this is in thousands of wildebeests, right? So that's how many thousands of wildebeests. So for each additional 1,000 wildebeests, this is a big population wildebeest which again makes sense that 
I would be extrapolating or going outside the X values provided in the data set because this is not 200, but three more zeros on there, lots more wildebeests. And so I can't really use this data to predict no wildebeests, okay? Last question, interpret the standard deviation of the residuals in R. Okay, so they like to ask these in pairs. So what's S and what's R? So S is right here, no worries. And S always has the label of the Y, okay? Because it tells us how far off a typical um, prediction would be. And so uh, this is in percent burned. What is R? Okay, we know R is negative because our slope is negative. And so we just need to take the square root of 64. Well, I already know the square root of 64 is about eight. Okay, so that number is about eight. I don't even need my calculator. Um, did it say interpret R? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what is that? So there's a strong negative and that's what we can tell because it's 0.8, uh, ne negative 0.8, excuse me. So that's close to negative one, which would be perfectly strong, all the dots on the line. Um, but what did it say? Oops, it said, what is R squared? Okay, so I can talk about what is R squared. R squared is the value they gave me, but we prepped either one. R squared is 0.646. And then I have to interpret what that means. So our script in our notes says that that means that the actual, whatever true data I collect, the actual percent burned area is typically about 0.6. Oops, I'm doing this one first. The actual percent burnt is typically off by about 15.988. Percent away from the predicted if we're using this least squared regression line. Okay. Um, so again, what is R squared? That's my last one. So let me just highlight this. S, and this is what S is. R, and this is what R tells me. Slope, and this is what slope means, right? So I still need to say what R squared means, okay? And that comes straight from our script. R squared was given to us in the problem, and it means that about 64.6% of the variability In percentage of burned area is accounted for by the least squared regression line um, with X is um, thousands of wildebeests. So that is our last one there. That's what R squared means. So what could be another one? Well, the type of tree, maybe certain, not maybe, I know certain trees burn more easily than others. Um, and so oftentimes in forest fires, prone areas, they plant certain types of trees to cut down on that because so, certain trees burn hotter um, than others. And so, that could be accounted for, but at least here, we did collect some data that the more wildebeest there are, the fewer the forest fires. And so we say thank you for wildebeest. Thanks, for, guys. See you next.